Uh, let's focus on the fundamentals here behind the technicals, and we have just the person for that. Phil Striebel joins us this morning, Chief Market Strategist at Blue Line Futures. Phil, welcome. Good morning to you. The ECB went ahead with a 25 basis point rate hike. Is that what you were expecting? Yeah, it's a 10th consecutive rate hike. There was a 64% chance that they raised 25 basis points. They're raising the inflation forecast for 2024, and they're also cutting their growth forecast. So that's going to equal stagflation next year. You know, the problem is, is that prices are rising faster than they can handle. Their inflation is like north of 5%. So that puts the euro currency down about 1.25% on the year. Dollar index up 2.2%. So I had to back up the chart, and I looked at, you know, when we peaked in July, it was about July 7th. We peaked right around 113. This is the euro currency. And I wanted to see what happened leading into that rally because we went up about four handles, 109 to 113. Mm -hmm. The trigger was a miss in the U.S. payroll number, which pulled out interest rate hike expectations mm -hmm. of us. So it tells you that I really believe that like our data is more important on the direction of the euro currency. And it's really that inverse relationship between the U.S. dollar. So we need to see misses on U.S. data in order to really turn the tide on the euro. That's interesting, Phil, because I've been kind of arguing the other side of that coin in some ways saying, okay, yeah, expectations are that the Fed's not necessarily going to have to raise as aggressively as the ECB and the BOE. And in theory, you would think that that would rally the currency's way on the U.S. dollar, but that has more weight on expectations in terms of the euro economy, the U.K.'s economy. I mean, in this higher rate environment, they're going to have a difficult time uh, to get things off the ground, and they're going to be struggling. We saw that in the data this week in terms of the industrial production numbers out of Europe. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that total teeter-totter effect. So, you know, I don't know what, they're, obviously the market, with them breaking the, the euro down like that, it really looks like they're over-tightening mm -hmm. um, much more than the U.S. is right now. They've got to fight it. But the problem is, is how do you, how are you a central bank for 20 different countries? I mean, yeah. it's like each yeah. country is going to have its own dynamic. So I've never been a believer in the euro currency. I thought it was just way too, it's just, it's just way too, too, too big to handle. I mean, you know, it's tough enough looking at what the different dynamics in the U.S. from state to state are, let alone 20 different countries. And they've got, you know, a whole whole nother world of different problems over there than we have so you know i'm really surprised like not to shift out of like the currencies but you know gold's doing a really good job it's only well, done wait, a couple Phil, before you shift out of those real quick because i want to stick with this yeah. conversation for another second in terms of uh the, the the state to state some of the discrepancies obviously the eurozone a different situation but in terms of some of the problems we have here does this set the tone for the fed next week at all uh, it's a 93% chance that they won't raise rates. So we'll check. I'll check that as soon as we hop off. It's the okay. CME's Fed watch tool. So not yet necessarily. No, and then if you look at November, it's just a little bit under 50-50 as far as yeah. the probability of an interest rate hike. So, um, you know, I, I, I just saw also, I think it was JP Morgan, they came out and they said that uh, they believe that really the Fed might be done, that there's not going to be another rate hike after this. So we'll see if that has any validity. I surely hope so, because the housing market is you know, prices are, they're starting to come down here. I see prices dropping left and right, but with those higher interest rate payments, holy cow, it's tough to, but tough to a pill to swallow here, those payments. Absolutely. And then uh, before we get on to some of the other products that you have your eye on, I think we should be watching, just sticking with that currency discussion for another minute. You've got the Bank of England and the Bank of Japan, in addition to uh, the Fed next week at the top of the list in terms of central bankers. And there's others as well. I mean, a busy week for currency markets to say the least, Phil. Yeah, all the currencies, though, they, they've been really kind of a um, snooze fest for the last two months. You look at ones even like the Swiss franc just drifting lower, not really a lot of volatility there. Canadian dollar really disappointing given the strength and some of the natural resources like crude oil and things like that. You know, British pound has come off quite a bit. Speaking of new low right now, the euro currency, that key level you want to watch if you back up on a daily chart, about four or five days ago, it reached its new uh, recent cycle low. And so there's probably going to be a lot of stop losses right around like that 106.90, whatever the low was here just recently, 106.92 and a half uh, as of this announcement. So 106.90, I think was the low 
from four or five days ago. There's got to be a lot of stops around there. I've got a May low down here, it looks like, at uh, 106.47, and we are right on that number as we speak here, uh, just a matter of ticks away from that. And then should you take that out, you've got a low from, uh, looks like, end of February, end of March, down around uh, 105.50, 105.45 here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, I actually would argue that we've seen some conviction in the yen to the downside. Some of the other currencies, not as much so, but definitely some weakness in the yen as we head into that meeting next week. Talk to us. I feel like you were headed into a crude discussion a minute ago when I kind of hit the brakes on that for a second just to finish up that financial focus here with energies and some of the price activity we're seeing there. I'd imagine that's where your focus has been as well, Phil. Well, I mean, energy is almost a currency play right now because the higher that energy prices go, the more it impacts inflation, the higher that expectations yeah. are for another interest rate hike and the currency mm -hmm. behind it. So dollar index, you know, just under 105. And it's it's hilarious because a few months ago, people were saying the demise of the dollar and it's all over and look at it right now. Right. I mean, you know, they, they don't get too far though. I mean, the dollar index, I don't think we're gonna see like 106, 107. I could be wrong, but you know, generally these things work in price bands here. So it'd be nice to see if it could if it could pull back from, you know, these levels where we're at at the moment. And then if you look at the, the 10 year treasury yield, it actually didn't really move too much on that. Uh, we're anchored at 4.23%. So um, not a lot of action in treasuries whatsoever. So I kind of like this this move that we have right here in some of these other outside markets. I know that um, you know China they cut that reserve requirement mm -hmm. ratio 25 basis points. That's what took the copper up earlier. So I like where all the commodities are at. I hope they stay here for a little while and we don't get a, a big knee jerk reaction when the other data comes out. Phil, at what point does this move up in crude derail some of the momentum we've been seeing or the indices' ability to shrug off the negative and focus on the positive? Uh, crude oil, I think that, I mean, this was such a such a move by OPEC, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. They know that they needed to balance their budget by year end. They got to do it at $85. So they got it north of there. They throttle it up there through the rest of the year. So I think crude oil prices, that, that correction on there is going to be real shallow, maybe mid-80s. Um, on the downside, but it's going to hold pretty firm. You keep seeing, you know, the EIA reports, they're coming in and they're, they have big misses or, or, mm -hmm. or throttling mm -hmm. below that five-year average. So it doesn't seem like there's much here to, to kill the oil rally at the moment. Phil, lastly, we'll let you get out of here uh, and on with your day. Talk to me about after the CPI number yesterday, how close are you watching the producer side of things today, the jobless numbers, a strong number last week, and then uh, lastly, we also have the retail sales number headed our way in just about uh, four minutes. Yeah, retail sales have been relentless. The malls around here have been packed, so I think that it's going to come in not as hot as last time, slightly below it. Initial claims, if you're a precious metals guy, you like gold and silver, you need that initial claims on them to keep ticking up here because it's going to need, employment's going to need to be derailed in order to, um, you know, really get the Fed stopping in their tracks at the moment. I would not have put you as being a mall rat, Phil, but uh, appreciate you joining us here to take a look at uh, some of the trends we're seeing in terms of price activity, get ahead of the numbers as well, and uh, ultimately uh, the broader discussion here as far as the economy. Phil Strebel joining us this morning for that chief market strategist at Blue Line Future.